Mike, it's been such a great weekend here in California. I envy where you live. Don't envy your taxes. I envy where you live. It's been a great place just to be around your leadership and the people. This is a special place. Let, let's pray. Father, I do thank you for each life represented here. Not only who they are and what they've done, but Lord, what they can be and what they can do. And I just ask for a divine charge that by your spirit, you would give us a new vision of how to look at ourselves, how to look at marriage, and how to look at you. Lord, open up our hearts and minds, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Whenever I'm talking to a new group, I found there's a question I can ask everyone that sort of gives me a feel for who I'm talking to. Because you can divide the world into two groups of people. There are dog people and there are cat people. So just so I can figure out, here we are in Southern California, how many dog people do we have here? So, whoa, all right. And how many cat people who will publicly admit it? All right, a little fewer. You know what? The dog people always win because dogs are better. They just are. I've been, I've been a dog person my entire life, which is why I never thought that part of being a loving husband would be having a sincere funeral for a cat. But that actually is what happened rather early on in my marriage. My wife and I had been married, I don't know, six or seven years. We just had one little toddler at the time. I was going to seminary. We had almost no money, so we rented this tiny little rundown house that had a shared driveway right next to another very tiny house. And that was occupied by a single gal who lived there with her cat named Remington. And Remington, as cats often would do, would sort of claim the whole property, would go all over and whatnot. And, and one morning I was coming out of our shared driveway and right out onto the street in front of the driveway I saw Remington. He'd been hit overnight, a car, a truck, something had gotten him. I thought, I can't just leave him here. So I parked my car, went up to our neighbor's house as gently as I could, tried to explain what I'd found. She came running out and saw Remington just collapses on the spot crying. Well, that commotion drew my wife and daughter's attention, so they came out. They saw Remington. Now they're crying. That practically left me crying, not between you and me that I cared that much about one less cat in the world, but I'm just trying to be a thoughtful husband and father and friend. They finally decided we needed to give Remington a proper funeral, and since I was going to seminary, I was chosen to officiate. So my first funeral was literally for a cat. You can't make some of these up. But I actually learned a couple lessons that will apply. One, I learned that people just like to speak well of the dead. And at a funeral, it's best just to keep quiet, even if you believe otherwise. For instance, they were saying that Remington seemed like he was an unusually smart cat. And I kept thinking, how smart could he be? He was a cat. He got hit by a car. You think he could just jump out of the way. But no, you hold your tongue. You let him praise him. So that went on. We finally got him in the ground, and I thought with some degree of sensitivity I could go about my day. So my wife and daughter peel off into our house. Our neighbor goes into hers. And as soon as I touched the door handle of my car, I could taste freedom. I heard a scream coming from my neighbor's house. I ran up to the house. I saw her. She's white-faced. I mean, so ashen. She can't even speak. She just turns and points at the couch, and there sat Remington waving his tail. We would buried somebody else's cat. <laughs> to this day, we don't know whose cat we buried. We know it wasn't Remington. So the second lesson I learned is make sure you're burying the right person. I mean, everything was a farce about my first funeral. But I just remember wanting to be focused because I wanted to be a good supportive husband. And, and I, how do you do that even when you don't really care about cats, but you got to serve her by having a funeral for cats. And, and if I could go back and speak to myself as a young husband, I'd say, Gary, all of those to-do things that you're thinking about, it really could be brought down into three truths. I, I wanted to be a better husband. Some of you are single. You want to think, what does it mean to be a good husband or wife? There are really three truths, I believe, that will build what we could call an unshakable Marriage. Pastor Todd started a series two weeks ago. It's been fantastic on 2 Peter on an unshakable life. And so sort of in the middle of that, we're talking about what builds an unshakable marriage. Now to do that, I believe we always go back. Transformation is rooted in scripture in Romans 12, 2, when it says, be transformed by the renewing of your 
mind. So rather than give you a bunch of to-do lists to do, it's really how do we think about things differently? If I want an unshakable marriage, how do I transform the way I think, or if I want to eventually get married, how do I transform the way about how I think about marriage and its purpose, about how myself and what I need most in marriage, and third, about how marriage transforms the way I relate to God. And if I keep these three things in line, I believe that I can build and that you can build an unshakable marriage, thinking differently about marriage, what it is, about my greatest need, and about how it transforms my relationship with God. So let's deal with the first one, how marriage changes the way we, how we need to think about, change the way we think about marriage and what it involves. I believe we need to get what I've been calling the magnificent obsession. That be, needs to become the focus of our life. And before I explain what the magnificent obsession is, let me explain the need that it addresses. Because I've been writing and speaking on marriage for so long, I read all of the reviews and the evaluation, the polls of why marriages break up and see the normal things you've probably heard, money issues, in-law issues, intimacy issues, addictions or whatnot. But I'm going to be honest, just sitting in a pastor's office more often than not, if you look beyond those issues at what's really going on, you know what I see breaking up more marriages than just about anything else? It's boredom. Two people get bored with each other. They've been together for so long, they feel like the spark has gone out. They, do I want to keep doing this? And, and part of that is rooted in the very human condition because when you think about it, none of us are so fascinating that we can keep somebody enthralled for 50 or 60 years. We're just, we're just not. I mean, five or six dates, yeah, you can do that. Five or six years, that's a challenge. 50 or 60, not a chance. I mean, even if you're Jerry Seinfeld or Tina Fey, after a while, your spouse knows all of the punchlines, right? They know all the funny stories. They know every political position you have, every theological belief. It just doesn't seem like there's that much more to fascinate us with each other anymore, even though at the start, it was so fascinating. But there's a spiritual truth behind this that the magnificent obsession will address. What it tells me is that we were made for more than each other. We were made for more than each other. It might seem odd that you start a sermon on marriage saying we need to look outside of our marriage, but I believe we will have an unshakable marriage when we begin to realize that we have to look outside of marriage for our meaning and our purpose because God made us for more than marriage. You can have a very fulfilling life as a single person. You can have a very fulfilling life if you're in a difficult marriage, and you can have a very fulfilling life if you're in an intimate and rich marriage. Because our life isn't defined by whether we're married or the state of our marriage, but a prior purpose that Jesus mentions in the Sermon on the Mount. In the heart of the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon ever preached, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Jesus describes what I'm calling the magnificent obsession when he says this, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now in the Greek, it's present continuous tense. So essentially Jesus is saying, whatever situation you're in, whatever station in life, if you want the best life, if you want everything else added to you as well, continually keep on seeking the kingdom of God. Not an intimate marriage, not successful kids, not a prosperous career, not your own self aims and pleasures. He says you will work best, you will feel most fulfilled. When you're seeking first God's kingdom. And what does that mean to seek first God's kingdom? God's kingdom, as you know, it's not a physical place. It's his authority. It's his influence. So to seek first God's kingdom, first his kingdom means I wake up and I'm consumed with his agenda, not mine. Instead of how I can get ahead, how I can get my needs met, how I can get this person to do what I want him to do, how I hope the weather meets with my plans. It's taking a step back and saying, Lord, today is a new day. You've given me certain gifts and resources and opportunities. How do I use all of that to accomplish the work that you want to do? Maybe there's somebody I need to call and encourage. There's somebody I need to notice. Maybe I don't even know who it is, but, but you'll awaken me. So, Lord, I just give myself up today to be part of the adventure of having an eternally significant life by building your kingdom that never ends. 
You were created for nothing less than a life of significant eternal impact. And if you settle for selfish aims, if it's just about making money or making yourself happy by having a wise marital match or, or having the, the best kids or whatever it is, eventually there'll be this restlessness in your heart. God is too kind. He loves you too much to let you settle for a selfish life. And you're going to feel that restlessness. You're going to say, I just feel like there's got to be more to life than this. And here's what happens tragically, I believe. When that happens, people usually blame their spouse. Instead of evaluating what they're living for, they're thinking, if I would have married somebody more enchanting, if I would have married somebody more interesting, if I would have married somebody that was more interested in me or, or paid more attention to me, then I wouldn't have these feelings. But the problem isn't your feelings. The problem is a lack of purpose. Two weeks ago, Pastor Todd talked about how there's two groups of people. There's the saved people and the sent people. And that's what Jesus is saying here. You were created to be sent. And life will never make sense if you're not living, not just as husband and wife, but as brother and sister in Christ, saying we have to live for an end greater than ourselves. And what is that? Whether we're going to focus on the athletic community or the public schools or we have our own business or we're heavily involved in the local church, we're realizing that we were made for more than each other and our marriage will never truly thrive until we're living beyond ourselves because small lives can't create big marriages. Small lives can't create big marriages. I don't care how much money you have, how glamorous your job, how beautiful the two of you are. If a marriage is based on selfishness, it gets boring. You live in a part of the country that has some of the wealthiest, most famous, most beautiful people in the world. How do their marriages work out? Because there's no glamorous matching that will ever eclipse your need to have an eternal, eternally significant life seeking first the kingdom of God, which is why I tell singles, don't worry about falling out of love. I mean, infatuation has a shelf life, 12 to 18 months. It hits hard. It's wonderful. Enjoy it. But eventually, neurochemically, literally, unless you have a damaged brain, you can't sustain an infatuation, which is why I say don't worry about falling out of love. Worry about falling out of purpose. Because it's a lack of purpose that drags on marriages because then we ask our marriage to make up for having a small life and we blame our spouse and we just can't. Angela Duckworth, who wrote the book Grit, says this, what ripens passion is the conviction that your work matters. And I'd say the same is true for marriage. For most people, interest without purpose is nearly impossible to sustain for a lifetime. We're not meant to be enchanted by another person, no matter how beautiful, how witty, how into us they are. God didn't design us for that. God designed us to be servants in his kingdom. And not, life will never fully make sense until we're doing that. Now, the second half of the magnificent obsession, next to seeking first the kingdom of God, he says, and his righteousness. Now, Jesus isn't particularly addressing marriage, but if we apply it to marriage, it's so powerful. Because if I do what Jesus tells me to do and seek first his right, I wake up, I'm not trying to change my kids, I'm not trying to change my spouse, I'm not trying to train everybody who drives on I-5, right? I, my first thought is, how do I seek first his righteousness? What is not right within me? What do I lack within me? And if I do that, here's what's going on. I'm dying to everything that destroys most marriages. It's the little sins that make everybody miserable. And, and not only am I dying to things like uh, pride and greed and negativity and lust and all of those things that will destroy a marriage, I'm bringing in the positive character qualities of Christ. Gentleness, patience, self-control, courage. And so I'm becoming the kind of person who can sustain a life long marriage. I'll, I'll tell you this, when, when, when couples come into my office as a pastor, it's not ever, hardly ever, have I heard somebody say, the problem is somebody's physical appearance. It's always a behavioral issue. My spouse is doing this, or my spouse is doing that. How do I get them stuff? So if we could just deal with people seeking first God's righteousness, how different the marriages will be. 
I did a, a blog post once, a shameless plug, but if you like to read a marriage-related blog, it's GaryThomas.com. And in, in this post, I just talked about how I notice couples coming in when a husband has an unusual level of anger toward his wife. And it seems to go out of sorts with, with what the situation would demand. This isn't true in 100% of the cases, but about 80% of the cases, when I see a husband with persistent anger toward his wife, if I keep pressing, I find out he's got some sort of pornography use in his background or that is currently going on. And I write in that blog post about how I think porn creates angry husbands. But they're the thing. People think this is the issue. How do I resolve this anger with my wife? Well, seek first Christ's righteousness to pull up the anger by its roots. Because they think the whole issue is what their wife just did. And then I have to tell them, no. I don't think that's why you're angry. It's not because of what your wife just said. I think you're angry because of what you did two nights ago. And this is the spiritual fruit. When I first got married, I may have been the most selfish person on this planet. I really was self-absorbed. God has so challenged me. And one of the things I love is that he has given me great pleasure in serving my wife. One of my highest joys is finding ways to make my wife's life better. So when she was visiting um, one of our kids and she was out of town when I had to stay in town to work, I was still finding something to do for her every day. I'm filling up the gas tank. I got some of her, her boot shined or whatnot. It's just, I just got so used to it and I enjoyed it. I'm still finding ways to serve her even when she's not there. And when I think of my wife over 30 years of marriage, how kind she's become. She focuses on kindness. She's so kind toward me. I, I just want to ask you, imagine how a marriage would change if you're daily pouring in more kindness and you're daily pouring in more unselfishness. And, and those are just two virtues. I mean, then add gentleness and patience and courage and you can transform a marriage. And singles, you can start to do this before you get married. You can actually create a better marriage before you even know who you're married to by becoming a more spiritually mature person. Because you're setting up the ability to have that kind of intimate relationship. Which is why I don't just tell couples, don't worry about falling out of love, worry about falling out of purpose. Then I'll say, hey, don't worry about falling out of love, worry about falling out of repentance. That's what you should worry about. When we stop repenting, when we put up with our sins, that's what makes marriage miserable. Now here's the thing. Jesus, I'm to seek this first. My first concern isn't my wife's holiness, even my kid's holiness, it's my holiness. Now, I don't have to grow in holiness to be saved. You're well taught here in this church. It's not about a matter of salvation, but here's what I found. When I permit ungodliness in my life, my wife pays for it first. My kids pay for it second. I don't want to put that burden on them. I want to bless them by doing what Jesus tells me to do. Seek first his kingdom so I don't blame my wife if life doesn't seem purpose and his righteousness so I don't ask my kids and my spouse to carry the burden of my lack of spiritual maturity. So, how do we build an unshakable marriage? We get lost in the magnificent obsession that calls us to purpose and repentance. The second thing that we have to do is learn what our greatest need is. If I were to ask you what your greatest need is today, what do you think you would say? It's often a question we never deal with consciously, but, but let me just say, not what you want five years from now, what you think you need in 10 years, but right now, as you sit here, so say, what's your greatest need right now? What would you say it is? The reason I want to bring it up is because that need is driving you, even if you haven't labeled it, even if you haven't taken control of it, it is driving you. I know what that need is because if somebody frustrates it, that's what makes you angry. If somebody looks like it might be taken away, that's what makes you fearful. It is driving you, but you might not even know what it is. There's a friend of mine who is a worship pastor, and one of the difficult things for him is that because he leads worship, he has to get to church on time. You know, the worship team can cover for a pastor if he comes in a few minutes late. The worship team starts the service off, and he's got young kids, which makes it a battle every week. So he and his wife have this little ritual where basically whatever kid is ready when he, have to leave, when he has to leave, he takes that kid. She follows along behind with the other kids. One weekend, it was just his little toddler girl, 
And, and so he put her in the minivan in the back seat. He's running behind, so he's driving to church like this, you know, worried about all of that. He gets to church, jams the car into park, runs around, opens up the side of the minivan, and his heart just sinks. His wife had left a tube of red lipstick in the back seat, and the little girl had found it, and she had painted her face, all right? She looked like a clown. It had gone from her lips up to her hair, and it, I mean, just all over her face. And he's like, oh, honey, we don't have time for this. Give me the lipstick. She goes, but daddy, I'm not beautiful yet. He goes, honey, you don't need lipstick to be beautiful. She goes, you don't? No, you need foundation, mascara, you need blush. <laughs> Here's this little girl, just as a youngest, she thinks, I'm going to church, what do I need? I need to be pretty. When you wake up, what do you think you really need? When I first got married, I'll tell you what I thought I needed. I thought my greatest need was to be loved. I thought that's why I was getting married. The whole notion of a soulmate, I want somebody who's got my back, who's going to love me like nobody else has loved me, who will always be loyal, who will always be there, who will make life busy or, or meaningful, who will always notice me and appreciate me. I thought that was my greatest need because when I read novels or listened to music or, or list, watched movies, that was always a thing, finding that person that makes your life complete. But on the day I got married, I believe God would have said, Gary, that's not your greatest need because I've met that need. If you will receive it, I've loved you as no one else has ever loved you or ever will love you. I sent my son to die for your sins. I've, I've given you my spirit who will comfort you and convict you and, and won't let you wreck your life. He's going to make you miserable till you repent and turn around. I, I've got you covered. So your greatest need isn't to be loved because that's been met. Your greatest need is to learn how to love. The greatest need isn't to be loved, it's to learn how to love. Now, I've got to be honest, God had to hit me over the head with this lesson about 10 times before I owned it. I didn't really want to embrace it. I didn't understand the power of what it meant. And let me also say, if you're here this morning and you don't know where you stand with God, if you haven't had the experience like Pastor Todd talked about last week, where you really make the choice, am I a believer? Have I given all to God's kingdom? Your greatest need is to be loved. It's everybody's fundamental need to be loved by God. But once you are in Christ, if you know you are saved, if you know you're in the kingdom of God, then your greatest need isn't to be loved that's been met. Your greatest need is to learn how to love. And here's how that transformed my marriage. When I thought my greatest need was to be loved and I didn't feel like I was loved or appreciated the way I should be, what happens? Anger, resentment, bitterness, and frustration. I'll tell you something, if you wake up tomorrow morning and you really believe in the depths of your soul, your greatest need is to learn how to love, every day of marriage gives you many opportunities to learn how to love somebody who isn't perfect. James 3, 2 says, we all stumble in many ways. So maybe you get to learn how to love an impatient person or a person having a bad day or a distracted person or an apathetic person or an addicted person. There are no, no, really no limits to how we have to grow in our ability to love when we believe that our greatest need is to learn how to love. Now, I don't want you to take my opinion that this is our greatest need. I would rather make an appeal to Scripture. Partly it's from what Scripture says and partly it's from what Scripture doesn't. I've asked anybody to find me one verse in the Bible, just one that says your greatest need is to find a romantic partner who will fulfill you for the rest of your life. That verse doesn't exist. And because God loves you so much, if that was your greatest need, he'd tell you, go get it. Because God wants the best for you. But there are dozens of verses that talk about the need to grow in love, that you need to love extravagantly, you need to love even your enemies. Because God goes, this is what you really need, and that's why God keeps reminding us with different voices. Let me give you just a couple examples. Colossians 3.14, the Apostle Paul has given a number of things that he wants the Colossians to do. There, there were no long-term Christians in Colossus when Paul visited them. They were all baby Christians. They didn't have other mature Christians that could tell them this is what it's like to be in Christ. So it's a fascinating book where he's telling these newborn Christians, this is how Christians act. And after a list of things, he finally summarizes it and says, you know what? 
can almost forget what I said. Here's what really matters. Above all, above all, more important than anything else, clothe yourselves with love. So when it comes down to it, to be the people of Christ or to be people who excel at love. And we go forward to 1 Peter. Now, if you're not familiar with the Bible, Peter was written by a man named Peter. Guess that, right? Colossians written by Paul. Peter writes 1 Peter. And notice how Peter says almost the identical thing to the early church, even using the same language. Above all, he says, maintain constant love for one another. Now, if you know Peter and Paul, you know they couldn't be more unalike. Paul is a meditative, scholastic kind of guy. He grew up around the church environment. Peter, the tempestuous fisherman, filled with emotions. He didn't have scholastic training. It, it certainly wasn't his personality. When you see two people teach, often you know what they naturally gravitate toward because you kind of like to preach what you think you are. That wasn't true of either Peter or Paul. So how did two men from such different situations, different temperaments, different backgrounds, different trainings, how do they both conclude, talking to the early church, that what really matters in the Christian faith is that we master the art of loving others like no one else? And the answer is, they were listening to the same teacher. And that teacher was Jesus Christ. I think in one of the most magisterial passages in the Bible, occurred at the Last Supper. John chapter 13, when Jesus told his disciples what needed to happen now that he was leaving them. He begins with this, a new commandment I give to you. And I would stop. Some people say, where does the Bible call Jesus God? Jesus calls himself God right here. A prophet can't give out commandments. A prophet can say, this is what God means when he commands this. But Jesus is showing the disciples his authority, his deity. Look, I'm giving you a new commandment. I have the authority to do this. This is what matters from here on out. And this is what holds all of us who accept Christ as our Lord. She said, this is the commandment we must now live by. Here it is, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And he explains why. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another another. It's a picture of Jesus saying, I'm going to create a community so skilled at loving people that everybody's going to look at it and say, there's just something about the Christians that are different. If we were to apply it to marriage, you should be able to look at a Christian husband or you look at a Christian wife, the way they talk about each other, the way they serve each other, the way they support each other and celebrate and cherish each other. And there should be this moment of recognition. You watch him. You listen to them, and it's, oh, I got it. I, I bet you they're one of those Christian couples. Because see, whenever I see a man treat his wife that way, or whenever I hear a woman talk about her husband, it always ends up being one of those Christians. They must be one of those Christians. Look at the way they love each other. Now, most of us wouldn't think the world looks at us that way, would they? And the divorce rates wouldn't suggest that that, in fact, is the case and the convicting thing is why not maybe we haven't accepted this as a commandment maybe we don't think learning how to love is really all that important at least not as important as making a living and getting our needs met and creating our spouse to to be a machine that just loves us as we want to be loved a lot of us that's what we seek first to do but Jesus says something entirely different that our greatest need is to learn how to love. And I want to tell you, this may be the front battle of spiritual warfare today. You know why? Because if we started doing this, Satan knows he's toast. There's nothing he can do to defend against a community of people that have learned to love this way as Jesus tells us to because there's nothing in the world that compares with love. You know this in your own experience. Sin seems so enticing until it's committed and then we say, why did I do that? It makes us miserable. It brings up shame. We know this and yet we keep going back again and again. But when you live by love, there's no shame. There's no guilt. I got to, lust can't even begin to compete with the fulfillment of love. 
Gossip can't hold a candle to blessing someone and encouraging someone. Materialism and greed and oppression is not half as fulfilling as service and giving and, and encouraging. I mean, they just is nothing like love. And Satan's in a panic that you'll not only listen to this, but apply it. I could imagine him getting together with his flunky junior demon saying, we, we've got to fight back. This passage will end us. So look, you're going to go to the novelists. You're going to go to the movie producers. You're going to go to the songwriters. You'll go to the poets. We've got to get him obsessed with believing that their greatest need is to be loved. We're going to create this whole thing called the soulmate that you'll never be complete. You'll never be fulfilled until you find another human that can love you. Like only God can love you. They'll never be able to find that, of course, but they think they can. And when they're infatuated, it will feel like they have, but then the infatuation will die and they'll go through a cycle of relationships and their whole life will be spent finding something that doesn't exist. Because if they wake up that their real need really is to learn how to love, not to be loved, we lose everything. We can't defend against that. I got to tell you, I, next about what I'm to say, I don't think anything has changed my attitude in marriage more than this. I need to use marriage to learn how to love. If I don't, I often resent the pressures and the frustrations and the difficulties of marriage. I become like those people who drive to the gym and then do circles around the parking lot looking for a close place to park before they go into exercise. And have you lost the, the, the whole point? And not only do they do that, but then they go in and they're paying lots of money to get on machines that will make their arms sore and they're not cussing out, they'll get on the, the treadmill or the stair climber. It's so stupid, it's making me sweat, it's making me hurt, I'll be tired. Why do people do that? Why do people pay good money to go in machines that make them hurt, that make them tired? Because they're thinking in the back of their minds, I can be a different person. I can be fitter. I can be faster. I can be healthier. I can be a new person. What if we looked at marriage and family life that way? Why do I willingly get married? Why do I invite kids into my life? I can become more gentle. I can become humbler. I can become more patient. I can learn how to forgive and ask for forgiveness and, and live in the light instead of lying and deceiving. And all of those things, I, I want to be that better. It's going to hurt. It's going to be soreness. I'm going to be tired. My perseverance is going to be tested. But I believe I can become a different person in marriage. The third thing we have to rethink next to the magnificent obsession and what our greatest need is, is learning to embrace marriage as worship. I must think about how my relationship to God changes when I get married. Here's what I mean about that. I was actually a pacifist before my first daughter was born. I'd studied with an Anabaptist professor. I'd read a lot of books and heard talks on it. Everything blew apart the day my first daughter was born. Not because I read a new book or was convicted by a new sermon. All that happened, literally, the nurse lifted that baby up, put her on my wife's chest. I took a look at, one look at that baby girl and I said, anybody hurts her, I'm going to be doing prison ministry from the inside for the rest of my life. Whole different life calling here. And I think that's just a natural inclination, the protection that God gives you as a dad or as a mom. And God used that experience of being a, pa a parent to help me understand how he views my wife. See, as a single man, I claimed 1 John 3, 1. Behold, how great a love the Father has given us, lavished upon us, that we should be called the children of God. And in Ephesians 5, 1, we're called dearly loved children. And as a single man, rightfully, that was my identity. I'm God's son. It's my eternal mark. That's who I'll always be. But one time when I wasn't being the best husband at all, God convicted me saying, Gary, Lisa isn't just your wife. She's my daughter. And I expect you to treat her accordingly. Because if I'm God's son, that means my wife is his daughter. And that changed everything about my marriage. It changed everything about being married to a woman who's not perfect. Because, see, I know my kids aren't perfect. I know how they stumble. I know my son's already married, but I know what will most frustrate any future sons-in-laws I might have or each one of the daughters, which 
his wife, they would just let me pick. I think I could probably do a pretty good job for them. But you know what? I'm still praying, Lord. It's, it's scary to me how desperately I want my daughters to be loved. I know they can stumble in many ways, but I still wanted to be appreciated. I still wanted to be cherished. I still want them to be valued. And I realize that God looks at my wife, his daughter, the same way I look at my kids with a holier and purer passion. Everything about my marriage changed. You see, it is a foundational Christian truth to accept God as your heavenly father. But once you get married, he's more than that. If you want to transform your marriage, meditate on God as your heavenly father in law, because he is on the day you got married. And we think of all that we owe our heavenly father-in-law. It helps us live with somebody who stumbles in many ways because we're called to reverence God. When does God deserve to be reverenced? Always. Is there ever a time when God doesn't deserve to be reverenced? See, if I want an unshakable marriage and I base it on the worthiness of the person I marry and the Bible tells me that whoever I marry will stumble in many ways. We all stumble in many ways, James 3, 2. My marriage isn't going to be unshakable because when they don't act in a lovable way and I don't love them, it tells me there are going to be many times when I'm not loving my spouse. But when I root loving my wife in reverence and worship of God, who always deserves to be reverenced, who always deserves to be worshiped. Now I have an unshakable marriage. Now it can never be challenged. Now it will never end. My wife could be an 85-year-old arthritic Alzheimer's patient, and she is no less God's daughter then than she is today. And so rooting it in the worship of God gives me an unshakable marriage in a very shakable world. So, three things. If you want an unshakable marriage, if you want to prepare yourself for an unshakable marriage if you're single, give yourself over to the magnificent obsession. Matthew 6, Are you seeking his purpose or your own? Is the problem in your marriage selfishness and a lack of vision? Is the problem in your marriage a lack of repentance? And let me just say to you singles, if you're even contemplating seriously dating or marrying someone who's not a believer, how are you going to have an unshakable marriage when they don't share what should be your highest purpose? When they don't have the Holy Spirit within them to convict them and, and, and transform them? I, I just want, if you think you're going to nag your husband into being a better husband, young women, ask any married woman in here how well that works. But if you marry a man who is convicted by God when he prays, you have brought a powerful ally into your marriage. I'm telling you, just as a guy who speaks on marriage, I, I should be motivated to have a decent marriage because my livelihood kind of depends upon it, if you think about it. You want to be cynical. But 90% of the changes I made in my marriage has been because God's convicted me. Gary, that's my daughter. Nobody else is looking. I care how you talk about her. I care how you pray about her. I care how you treat her. Women, marry a guy. Guys, marry a woman who will be convicted by God, not depending on being nagged by you. Secondly, wrestle with the scriptures that we talked about. Colossians, 1 Peter, John 13. Your life will change. Your perspective on marriage changes. When you're convinced your greatest need is to learn how to love. Their spouse is having a bad day. All right, I have to learn how to how, help somebody have a bad day. Do I just let them have a bad day? Is it time to confront them? Is it time to deal with the real issues? How do I learn to love a person who stumbles in this way? That's what I need. I'm not going to resent it. I'm going to say, this is the purpose of marriage. And then finally... If you really want to have an unshakable marriage, you've got to root it in the worship of a perfect God. You were made for more than marriage. You were made to serve and enjoy and receive from God. And when marriage is a part of our worship, nothing on this earth can shake it. Let's pray. Father, you call us to what I believe to be the most beautiful life available. The magnificent obsession is not a heavy obligation. It is a glorious rescue of a meaningless, otherwise meaningless life. Lord, where I have 
not communicated well, I pray your spirit would fill in the blanks. Where I've left something out, I pray your spirit would speak to your people throughout the week. I pray you would bring this up in their memory. Whether they're single or married, Lord, I pray that you would use these scriptures to give us new vision and new hope and to think about marriage and ourselves in you in an entirely different way. Lord, I just commend them to you now as their ultimate teacher. In Jesus' name.